Okay, Chris, can you hear us? Chris? <laughs> Are you there? Are you there? There he is. Yeah, you're good, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. We're going to start with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Involving certain subject matters, such as personnel, cannot be made during these public input sessions. Public input can be made in person during board no. meetings and or submitted by email through the link at the top of each week agenda found on the district website. Email statements will be read during the first input session at the beginning of board meetings. Um, and I just want to clarify a few things before we start with public input. Um, we realize this is an emotional issue, and we ask everybody, please, be respectful in your comments. Um, we, there will be no uh, interaction with people that are speaking. People are coming up to say, give their statement and then sit. Um, this is not a time when you ask questions. It's not a time you question the board. We're going to be glad to have everybody here. We want to hear everybody's input. Um, I'm going to take it all under advisement, um, but it's not a time when we have a back and forth. Um, we are going to stick with three minutes. We're going to have a timer. So if you have a lengthy statement, very real fast, I guess. <laughs> um, and if someone else has stated pretty much what your thoughts are, um, you're more than welcome to come up and say, I agree with Mr. Smith, and maybe add one or two points, but if someone else I've already said basically what, what your statement is. Um, please don't read the whole thing so we can get, because I think we have quite a few people. And I think we're going to start with the online tonight comments. So we're going to read the emails. Okay. 
And I will be, I will read quickly. Um, we actually have only 12 public input statements, which is nice. 70 last week, so this is uh, this is better, um, at least in terms of the reading part. So here we go. Um, Chris, can you hear me okay? It's probably just going to give me a thumbs up on my computer back. Um, this is Danielle Minuti, North Berwick. As both a parent and a teacher, I ask that you reconsider the current mask policy and implement district-wide universal masking. Many schools in the state who had a similar policy to ours are reconsidering and requiring masks or a shutdown for quarantine. With universal masking, far fewer students will need to quarantine when we have positive cases. With optional masking, unvaccinated close contacts will need to quarantine and join remotely for several days. Please speak with admin and Amy Creighton. Ask about what will happen under both scenarios. Although there are many voices calling for optional masking, they base their opinions on potentially debunked misinformation, which cannot be weighed as equal um, to the contributions that are based on scientific fact. Corinna Cole of Lebanon. There are a lot of parents in Lebanon that are upset because of the mask mandate. The science does not support why the school board is forcing this mandate on their children. Please reconsider allowing masks to be optional at all grade levels. Christy Devlin Hayes of Berwick. I appreciate the evidence-based decision to enforce masking in K through seven. CDC studies are showing high COVID transmission nationwide in schools without mask mandates. And there have been several highly publicized instances where districts have lost multiple educators to COVID deaths in a single day or week. Hospitals are overflowing with child COVID cases. To protect our educators, their families, and families who either choose not to vaccinate or cannot get vaccinated due to health issues, I hope you'll consider reinstating a mask mandate throughout the entire district. Elementary students are also eating breakfast and snacks in the classroom while sitting close enough to touch one another. I hope there's a policy about social distancing and ventilation in spaces where students gather without masks. Thank you. Eric Dugo of Lebanon, our children are the least affected by COVID. As a parent with a first grader, this mandate is stunting their growth. Robert Harper of Berwick. First off, the fact that this meeting was changed to virtual is nothing but cowardly. This is just a tactic the board and superintendent is using to silence the majority of parents. Shame on you. Second, to mandate masks for children is unacceptable. The data shows that children are at an extremely low risk of transmission and becoming symptomatic from COVID-19. How many terrible flu seasons have we been through without masks? More children will die from the flu each year than all of the COVID pandemic combined. Lastly, I thank you for making these poor choices in regards to mandates and attempting to silence the community by hiding behind a computer screen. You have led a fire in the community and we will not tolerate these actions. You have inspired the citizens to become involved and this school board and superintendent will be looking for new employment. The lessons you are providing to us parents to teach our children about refusing to conform to tyranny is greatly appreciated. Bob Rudis of Berwick. I'm dismayed at the board not taking the health and safety of our children, the teachers, the administrative staff, and my school volunteers seriously. Fewer than 50% of the high school class is vaccinated. Maine ICUs are almost at capacity in every county, and there are reports from districts all over the U.S. of the Delta variant impacting the health and well-being of students and schools. Other studies have just been published regarding the punishing health effects of long COVID on teens and children. These are real, indisputable facts. From what I've seen on morning walks and bike rides during the first week of school, students who are supposed to be wearing masks on buses aren't. You aren't even enforcing a basic, sane requirement there, let alone doing the right thing, having everyone in the schools do something as simple as to put a piece of cloth on to protect themselves and their community. I'm further dismayed by how apparent it is that the community at large seems not to care about the health and safety of their peers by not volunteering to have their children wear masks. It makes me regret moving here a decade ago. You should all be ashamed of yourselves, and I'm truly sad that the health and safety of my child, and as a result, my family, is in your obviously incapable hands. If you aren't going to make this decision based on real facts, not many unproven theories handed down in social media and local social clubs, then how can we trust you to make any other decisions with the right data and facts for answers? <clears throat> Laura Mazzola, North Berwick. Good evening. I'd like to thank you for all the work you do for our schools. I'm sure it often feels like a thankless job, but please know you are appreciated. I'm writing to you as both a teacher in the district and a parent in the district. I have three children who are not old enough to receive the vaccination. Today I saw 49 students in my classroom over the course of the day. 
Of those 49 students, seven wore their masks. 14% of my students had masks on. In one class of 18, not a single student had a mask. This is what happens when we don't have a mask mandate. Students who probably had every intention of wearing masks chose not to because of what their peers were doing. Yesterday, there were 433 cases statewide. Today, there were 624. Schools starting for most districts for last week for this week. I would dare say the increase in cases has everything to do with the start of school. Most of these cases were in manners under the age of 20. I'm asking you to think about these numbers as you make your decision this evening. Thank you again. Um, we have an email from Victoria Savory from Lebanon. Um, it's kind of specific to her students, so I'm not going to read it because it's, it's more pertinent to her, and we will follow up with her specifically. It isn't really about this as much as it is about alternative learning. Thomas Strider of Lebanon. Kids who are vaccinated shouldn't have to wear face coverings. Those who are more concerned were given the choice to enroll their students in Noble Virtual Academy. Lindsay Kalker of North Berwick. I am a parent of two elementary children and also a teacher in a neighboring school district. With the current uptick in numbers and hospitalizations and increasing youth being affected by COVID-19, I am concerned that the district is not employing sufficient mitigation strategies in our schools. In fact, we are currently not following the recommended guidelines put forth by the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics. If our goal is to keep our kids in person in school, we need additional safety measures in place. The lack of a mask mandate at the high school is extremely concerning, as masks mostly protect those around the wear. I'm concerned about our students, but also our teachers who have families at home to protect as well. Additionally, over 300 school districts in Maine have signed onto the pooled testing program. I am hopeful that you can revisit offering this in our district. I worry that many parents did not realize the importance of answering the survey sent out this summer and hope that this option is still being considered for the district. I am a teacher in a local district where a weekly pool testing will be happening. Parents were sent videos to show how fast and easy the testing process will be, which helped to encourage many to sign on. I encourage more information to be sent out to families. Lack of distancing, lack of universal masking, and no regular testing is a likely path to illnesses and quarantine. I encourage you to listen to experts in the field while making your decisions this evening. Uh, Kristen Hardingham, just two more. Kristen Hardingham of Berwick, thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to express my support of the school board's decision to require universal masking of students and staff grades K through seven. It is my hope the school board will extend the universal masking requirement to include students and staff grades eight through 12. Masking has proven to be an easy and effective method of slowing the spread of COVID. We have the opportunity to teach our children that the health of our community as a whole is important and that their actions as members of a global community can directly impact the health and well-being of others. It is an opportunity to teach our children that minor personal inconveniences such as mask wearing do not outweigh the importance of safeguarding the health of our fellow humans, some of whom who do not yet have access to a safe and effective vaccine. And the last is Andrea Graft of Berwick. Good evening. I'm writing to you to ask that you institute a universal masking policy at the high school. I am the mother of a high school student plus three young children, including a newborn, and also a teacher in a neighboring district. Despite the availability of vaccines for high schoolers, the highly contagious Delta variant can be carried in nasal passages of both unvaccinated and vaccinated people and spread to others, which is why the CDC now strongly recommends indoor masking. Wearing a mask is most effective when everyone is wearing them. They primarily protect the people around you. Adoles adolescents face a great deal of social pressure, so masking when their friends aren't becomes a really difficult request. Regardless of our opinions about the mask and vaccines, I hope we can all agree that we want to keep kids in school. They need the emotional connection, quality instruction, and social time that remote and hybrid learning could not provide. Is it worth the freedom of optional masking if our high school, sh high school shut down, or worse, in cases at the high school that are brought home lead to high community spread? I would argue no. Please consider, consider instituting a universal masking policy, not just for families like ours with young children, but with the hope of keeping our schools open this entire year. Uh, could I just have a show of hands of how many people who would like to speak tonight so I know? Okay. Well, John Keeper will give you a warning when you have like 20 seconds or so left. Okay, anybody would like to start? Go for it. I can, I can start. <coughs> So, um, my name is uh, 
Jeremiah Mulligan. I'm from Berwick. Um, I have one kid that has already gone through the school system, and I have three in, in now. And I hate to disappoint everybody, but I'm not here to talk about maps. <laughs> Um, so my issue is I have a, I have a son that um, goes to SRTC over at Sanford um, and we're being told now that he is required to take the bus there um, rather than driving himself. He drove himself there all of last year and now he's required. So I mean again what we're here for I just I don't understand. I think we can all agree if we can agree on one thing that it would be it's more socially distanced and safer for kids to be able to drive themselves um, and I, I'm not necessarily worried about my son um, uh, catching COVID on the bus or or the effects of that that's not my concern my concern is he will be forced to quarantine for 10 days and then miss school so I just don't, I, I would just like um, the board and the school to take, take a look at this. Um, I, was, I was told, so I spoke today with uh, Mike Redman over at SRTC and I spoke with Allison Kearney here at Noble. Um, both were super, super helpful. They got back to me timely, um, gave me all the information I wanted to know. They did a great job. I appreciate that. Um, and from what I was told that this was a decision that all the districts that send kids to um, Sanford made this decision together and I would just like the school to reconsider this um, again I'm just uh, mainly mainly concerned about my son missing out on school and other activities because he was forced to ride a school bus if there was someone positive on the bus then he would would then be forced to miss school because of it. I mean, I think we can all agree that the safer, smarter thing to do is to allow them to drive there. So um, I just want to check my notes, make sure I don't have anything else I want to speak about. But um, I think that's it. Just a moment, I'll follow up with you on it. Let's give you a call. OK, sure. It's, uh, it's bigger than just the school board, so we, we'll have to talk right. about how to okay. approach it. OK? Perfect. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Please give your name and what time you're from to. I'd like to see one last name, too. <laughs> I just don't want my son being singled out. All right, no, I, it happens. All right, I'm Rick Pelletier. Um, came here last year. Uh, my son was uh, high honors for math, science, everything. And then you guys kept him at home three days out of the five days. And at the end of the year, they told me he didn't. He needed help, and all his, all his uh, classes and everything that they were offering him summer school. Thought that was a joke, you know. Um, so you can see what keeping kids away from school will do to them. You know, my son was 99.9 .9 percentile this whole state, and now he's not anywhere near it. So. I really appreciate that. Uh, second thing is, there's two board members on here that mocked us, parents. Good job. Not too, not too, not too smart is what I got to say about that. Um, I say the majority of us say it's our kid. We do what we want with our kid. It's not up to you guys. But I see you guys have the power. But I say that you know the majority says no mass. You should be listening to the parents. See that. Up here, this lady was just talking off about all this. It was all about wearing masks. Where were the people that said, you know, against it? I'm just saying. I'm just saying. We don't know if you guys are silencing people or not. So it's it happens. Trust me. Uh, second thing is is or whatever whatever number I'm on here. I say that if the majority of the parents saying no mask, we should go with that. Because if not, then I mean, we ought to pick it. The school. I mean, really, we, we need to be heard, you know, and our children can pick it as well because it's legal, totally legal. You guys want to hurt them, they're going to fight back too. And I say the last thing that, you know, if this school board can't get their act together and listen to the parents, I think we should defund the school. Uh, we've been pouring millions and millions and millions every more every year. And what do you guys do? You don't listen to the parents at all, you know? I said the majority. I mean, 
<coughs> most of us are saying it should be up to us, and yet you guys are like, oh, making fun of us, saying, you know, they're going to say this and they're going to say that, and you mock us. It's, you're one of them, Mr. Travis, and some other lady that all I saw was her eyes. I mean, who mocks people, you know? And you're on the school board, you should be ashamed. So that's all I got to say, and I'll be, I'll be around, I, I promise, you know. I promise I'll make my voice heard if you guys continue to pull these games on our children. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Matt Leggett, Lebanon uh, resident. I have a kid in ninth grade and <coughs> so. Um, I heard from the school board meeting two weeks ago, first two minutes, somebody came on the video chat and said parents would have different opinions. Someone spoke that you could find science on both sides. I just want to quickly show on Google, put COVID death, count by age. The first site is the CDC. You can click it. Go right here, sex and age. And it brings up the death count, by sex and age. It's not, not hard. It's not conflicting information. It's on the CDC website. So let's look at it real quick. Zero to 17, 400 deaths in the past year and a half for kids between zero and 17. <coughs> uh, that was just males from COVID. Total deaths, 54,771. Maybe we should focus a little more on where they're dying and not dying from COVID. Pneumonia deaths without COVID, 908 from pneumonia. Were we wearing masks for the flu? Were we wearing masks for pneumonia? No. So the science isn't conflicting. It's, it's right here. It's right in front of us. Pneumonia deaths, 908 for males, 413 for females. COVID deaths again, 400 for males. 178 for females between 0 and 17. Wake up. 0 to 17 are not being killed by COVID. It's not, <laughs> it's not hard to find. It's not some fake science. It's on the CDC website. If you're in the age get categories that are affected by COVID, you go to like 75 to 84, 171,000. It's a lot of deaths. That's terrible, right? This is a year later, we have a vaccine, right? We believe in the vaccine, I hope people do. Everyone makes their own choice on the vaccine. The vaccine lessens the symptoms, keeps people safe, keeps them from dying. So those who are affected by COVID can now be protected by the vaccine. Again, the children aren't dying from COVID. It shows it right on the CDC website. So what are we doing? Why are we masking kids? Why are we doing all these crazy things that we don't do for pneumonia, which kills kids twice as much as COVID. Why are we masking the children? I don't understand. It makes no sense. The numbers don't lie. This is not conflicting data. I just showed you how to get to it. You're more than welcome to look it up yourselves, but stop ignoring the parents. We're not stupid. It's not some made up numbers. It's not some conspiracy theory. About 10 seconds. Just okay, thank you. <laughs> So that's what I have in, I just want the board to listen to the parents. Real quickly, I did do a survey. It's not like an official survey. I just put it on the Facebook pages. 336 parents responded. 70% do not want mask mandates. 70%. I urge the school to send out their own survey so we can do an official one with known parents. Send out a survey, see what the parents say. Hi, I'm Sophie Larson from North Rowick. Madam <coughs> Chairwoman, honored board members, thank you for taking the time to hear my voice. Thank you also for requiring masks in K through 7. Um, please note that my children would not be in school were it otherwise. Now get to the point. Um, my students know me as a teacher with infinite patience, but they also know that the Iliad starts like this. Rage. Sing to me news of the wrath of Achilles. 
So what does an educator with near infinite patience do when the basic feeling is rage? I turn to something I say often to my students. It doesn't matter what I think, and it doesn't matter what you think. What matters is how we think. So it doesn't matter what I or you think about masks. What really matters is how we think. I'll show you how I think right now. I think about my students. The decision not to require masks in high school is an outrage in three parts. Firstly, it's deeply upsetting that my workplace doesn't comply with CDC and DOE guidelines for best practices. That decision sets a questionable precedent for our district. The timing of your decision two weeks ago adds insult to injury. It's virtually impossible for any teacher that feels uncomfortable with your decision to find out alternatives just 10 days before the start of school. Secondly, all my students, all your students, are guaranteed by law equal access to a meaningful education. The decision not to require masks in the building makes it unsafe for those that are disabled or immunocompromised. Relegating our most vulnerable students to an online experience is shameful and unconscionable because we all know online is not equal to being in person and forming valuable relationships with peers and teachers. Finally, and most importantly, I want as much in-person time with as many of my students as I can possibly get. I need it, so do they. And masks are one effective way of making it happen. Contact tracing procedures mean that with universal, with universal masking, more students have a better chance of spending more time in person. Again, the decision not to require masking in the high school cuts my precious time with my students unnecessarily short. I am so terribly disappointed that my students and I are not getting the best shot we can possibly have at in-person time rather than online. To finish up, I want to bring up our core values here at Noble. This is on the classroom wall in every room in our school. Um, this is the dream of Noble. Equity, collaboration, and community. Equity means that all students and staff must be safe in our buildings. Collaboration means listening to one another, and I urge you to listen to your teachers and staff, even those that can't come in front of you today to give input if they're not residents in your town. Oh, seek out their, thank you, seek out their voices and hear them. Their well-being is as essential to us as anything. If we don't safeguard it, we will continue to lose the best and brightest. Community means being together. That's why I'm here. I beg you, give teachers and students the very best chance to be together that we can possibly have. Please require masks in the high school as well. Hi, good evening. I'm Drew from Lebanon. I have two children in the district. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking the school board for voting to allow the high school to decide what was best for their own bodies and their health their health choices. I uh, decided to reject a one-size-fits-all approach to individual health. I hope you stand by this courageous decision and you don't allow politics or funding to change. So thank you for this. In regards to the younger kids, my kids, I was shocked that the school board members' individual comments prior to the masking vote last time. The majority of the board stated that they think the parents should have the right to choose what is best for their child, yet voted opposite for the K through seven. Um, basically voting to turn a recommendation into a mandate. Many board members' statements included uh, the phrase following the science or of masking. And I'm not here to list any, list any mass facts or argue them. Whether you think they are extremely effective or not at all, the fact remains that you chose to ignore a whole ton of other aspects of science in your choice for just one of them. Explaining to you all the various ways that children learn would be a waste of time, and I'm not going to do that to you. But you must admit that many various forms of learning are negatively impacted due to your choice for just one aspect of the science. The health of my family is and always has been a primary aspect of my life, both physical and mental. We do all kinds of various activities like go to the gym, hiking, biking, ballet, karate. We spend more money on gyms and the kids' activities than most new car payments. We buy the freshest, healthiest foods we can. We don't drink soda, so I'm hoping you can understand my frustration. 
I'm also curious um, where all your history teachers stand on this. History has also shown us um, the road that these mandates start to take, and it's ugly. You should ask your history teachers, maybe familiarize yourself with the Nuremberg trials if you're not. At this time, I'd also like to know where the district's uh, stance in teaching plan for the diversity and inclusion training is that you previously mentioned, which I've now come to learn is another name for critical race theory or CRT. To be honest, I'd like to see a statement from the district explaining the commitment and teaching and adhering to the American values and principles set forth by our Constitution and Bill of Rights. I think this would be the best diversity training tool. Oh, 15. Thank you. I know making these decisions can't come easy, and I believe you're all good people trying to do what you think is best. I realize this issue puts you in the hot seat, but that's what's involved with your position. Thank you for all the other things that you do for our district. Please take this chance to do the right thing. Thank you very much. I did have one question. Um, Jason York from Berwick, the <coughs> district. Um, I had some questions about board members and how much time they had left and for upcoming elections and things like that. I was wondering, who do I direct that to? Because I sent an email to the chair, but I didn't get a response back. See that. Like the Charlie, yeah. Yeah. Same email? Okay, yeah. right. Um, so, I'm for safety. I've been vaccinated. My wife has been. Um, I'm for proven things that help, such as ventilation, social distancing, um, things of that nature. It's all proven science. I'm for those kinds of methods. Um, I've found in my, what I've read up on, masks, especially the cloth ones, they're only useful for about 25 to 30 minutes in a setting. So if you're wearing a cloth mask and you're here for over an hour, you're, sh you're sharing air with other people and you're being contaminated. But we're gonna make our kids sit in a class all day long. So they're sharing the air with the other kids in their class that has the particles of COVID-19. That's CDC and other studies proven. So another proven CDC thing is that they studied 90,000 students in Georgia, Georgia this past fall where they didn't have mask requirements and then the schools where they did. And they found that there was no statistical evidence of any benefit from the students that wore masks. It was the same in both ways. So just masks of themselves are not helping prevent our students from getting COVID. Uh, the CDC has made the recommendation, sure, but what about the rest of the world? The WHO? has recommended that students don't wear masks because the risk of them getting COVID versus the negatives of the other aspects, such as the impact of their education, their social upbringing, <coughs> that there's, there's no, the risk there is not outweighing it. Um, countries like UK, Ireland, Scandinavia, France, Netherlands, Switzerland, Italy, they're all doing no masks at varying ages, two to five, two to 10, different ages like that where they don't wear masks based on what the WHO has said. I strongly recommend that the board sanctions a survey to the community. I think you'll find probably 70% or more is for making their own decisions for their students, for their kids, because they know what's best for them. My own son, I shared last time I was here, has been impacted negatively because he's had to have a mask and it's, it's hurt his, he's falling behind. So I'm not saying no mask, they're not helpful at all. Why can't we think a little bit more outside of the box? When they're sitting at their seat, take their mask off. But when they gotta go to the bathroom, put their mask on. About 15 seconds. Okay. Um, oh, there's been a lot of talk about hospitals being flooded in ICUs. I looked that up and most of that is from RSV and people have postponed surgeries. If you actually look at the details, most hospitals are not being overwhelmed by COVID. It's much, it's like 10% of their beds in the ICUs are actually COVID cases. So, so. Hello, I'm Brandon. I'm a new resident of Lebanon. Um, I'll talk quick because it's what I do. Um, 
I'm a father of two children with CHD, uh, one that just started kindergarten today and one that is due to be born uh, later this month. Uh, I knew this whole thing, I'm going to be very involved in my children's upbringing and their education. Um, but going off of the fact that I have a child that has CHD, he had an open heart surgery, he's had a very rough first five years of his life and now He's supposed to start, you know, start school. He's supposed to be in a classroom full of other kids and teachers wearing a mask, which <clears throat> we had a, I was watching a, a video earlier where somebody was taking one of those carbon monoxide sensors and they stuck inside the mask. And within the first minute, it tripled. It's, it's going to have a very adverse effect on my son's growth, his education. We, you know, he already has his problems. And making him wear a mask, he, he's just one of the drones going through. He has no individuality because he's just another kid forced to wear a mask, living in a world of fear that really doesn't need to be there. I mean, I got vaccinated earlier this year and I still got COVID. I did my quarantine, my entire family did the quarantine. We took care of ourselves. My son, fine he thrives but this this entire mandate is, is is stupid I'm his father she's his mother we should be able to decide what, what is the safest thing for my kid because I'm not going to ask anybody here or or other parents what is the best choice for my son that's my job it will always be my job until well frankly until I'm dead um, so I think that that choice should remain solely in the hands of, of his family and his parents, not in the hands of people who really do not give any care about, you know, my kid. So, thanks for your time. Thank you. Hi, good evening. My name is Peg Wheeler. I'm a Berwick parent, um, and I'm not going to speak for long because so much has already been said. Uh, I would like to support the teachers in this district. They may have kids or relatives who they're going to be more likely to bring this home to. They're going to be in classrooms with kids that aren't masked. My son, um, we do. We have a, I have a grandson that has CHD. As a matter of fact, his doctor is very concerned. He's three and he wears a mask everywhere I take him. Um, and that's what his medical team wants us to be doing. My high school student, um, who isn't easily pressured, did feel some pressure at school today when he was one of the only ones wearing a mask. Um, I don't understand, no part of me understands why we decided to take a recommendation made by the state and turn it into a public debate. I think that's asking for, for trouble. My son had a miserable past year. Um, he's, he, was, he missed his entire junior year. He missed the sports season. I really want him and his, his peers to have a senior year, to be here as much as they possibly can. If I'm not mistaken, SRTC has already had some issues that have caused quarantines, and not taking the one small thing we could do to protect each other I don't see this as a big deal. Am I having to wear a mask? I'm vaccinated. Most everybody I know is vaccinated. I, I don't know anybody personally who knows that you're having this discussion and having it turn into sort of a public vote. Most everybody I know thinks that all of these students should be wearing masks to protect each other. Not, it's irrelevant to my personal liberties as far as I'm concerned. This is really about a community issue. Um, so I would ask the school simply to follow the recommendations. I think school board spent many years on the school board. I'm pretty sure we do that with a lot of other things. And I'm not, I'm not clear. If this is now turned into a public vote, <laughs> I think you really do need to let people know that you need to show up here um, and place your vote about what you want to have done. I, I kind of hope that I can trust my school board members, my other elected municipal officials, to make decisions based on what the experts we rely on for other things advise us to do 
rather than take it down to, I, I can take any statistic you want, I'm a math person, and I can make it say anything you'd like it to say. I trust that the people who are in the positions to make those decisions and make these recommendations, the doctors and scientists, do it in our best interest. So I hope you'll do that. Thank you. Thank you. I didn't plan on speaking, but here are both sides. I'm the Victoria from Lebanon that did all mine private. So to mask or not, I agree. My child's mask or not is my decision. You guys are yours. I'm not going to fight that one out. My concern is if the child is not able to participate in school, I heard somebody else say if there was a mask, they wouldn't have their child there, whereas other people are the opposite. So my concern is the remote options which it's either, I know at the high school level, that's all I can speak about, it's either Play-Doh, which is a <coughs> kind of more along the lines of the first year, maybe a little more in depth, which I don't feel is best for my daughter. Going <coughs> to YCC and doing Play-Doh or whatever, it's like all over the map. She thrived best with the model of last year, remote learning. So if other people are pulling their kids out to me, that remote learning we did last year is the closest thing to being in person, still having that interaction as well as the accountability. So that was my concern beyond the to mask or not mask. So mm -hmm. the other concern is um, if people got a quarantine, then have them having that remote option so they don't fall behind is important. Or a staff member. What if somebody, a staff member, has a child at home and they can't be there having that remote? Like, I have a whole list of scenarios. Or, oh God forbid, the school does close down again, whether it's for two weeks or whatever. So, I think having the option of the remote learning to sustain all those scenarios, when I say remote, I mean that Google meets in class or in life, pretty much. So I want to consider that. The other thing is, is I'm not finding anywhere what the criteria we're doing if somebody tests positive, whether they had the you know, vaccine or not, do they have to quarantine, do they not? The CDC kind of keeps changing a little bit on whether you had the vaccine or not. So I would be really curious where that information is. If somebody tests positive, are they shut down, which means the remote learning is more important. So. Somebody at some point can direct me. I'll hold it until the end of the All right. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Mike Barker from North Berwick. Uh, first, I want to say I'm for parents' choice. There are a lot of things. I'm not going to say that it's an easy choice for the school board to make or for anybody. You're not going to make everybody happy. But you're going down. A kind of bad road. Somebody just spoke up here about the fact that their kid was kind of shamed because they were wearing a mask and other people weren't. How are you going to promote any individuality if you want everybody to conform? So you're asking the kids that even don't want to wear a mask, they have to conform to the people that do. You also, in certain policies, have made the case that masks don't work. The first gentleman that spoke talked about his kid on the bus. Everybody on the bus is supposed to be masked, but if somebody tests positive, they have to quarantine. If the masks work, why would they have to quarantine? You can't have it both ways. Everybody looks at the national data. We're looking nationwide at the data. Have you looked at the data? Like for your county, or for even the three communities that are here on what the case rate is for the three communities that attend our schools? Does anybody know what the percentage is of cases for Lebanon, North Berwick, and Berwick? So shouldn't the whole, the whole board should know. The whole board should know. Right? Out of the total population, total cases of all ages, 6.8%. So you're making judgment on things. You don't even know, you don't even know what the answer is. So it's kind of hypocritical to make these decisions and say you're gonna follow science or do things or whatever. You don't you don't even know it. You know, parents want to be able to make the decision. My daughter's a freshman. 
I had another daughter that went through the school. They're doing well. They get a decent education. Could it be better? It could always be better. They're doing well. My daughter does not want to wear a mask. I respect her right. We talk as a family, and she thrives in that way. If you want to wear the mask and you want your kid to, then that's okay. You can have that conversation. But even for somebody to stand up here and say that my kid was shamed because he was the only one or she was the only one wearing a mask and that your kid should to make my kid feel better, well, how come that kid can't take their mask off to make my kid feel better? That's all I have. Hello, my name is Robert Travers and I'm from Lebanon. I want to take a moment first to thank the two people that decided to follow the parents and vote no on the Title seven mandate. I, I, I don't have kids, I have none, but I was a former graduate of this school class of 2011. And as a citizen, I think that parents should be able to choose whether or not their kids Sorry, I think, sorry about that again. I can't, I can definitely speak English. <laughs> anyway, so as a citizen, I think that the, what, the choice as to whether or not our kids should wear masks or shouldn't wear masks shouldn't be up to anybody but the parents. At the end of the day, it's our right to make those decisions for ourselves and our kids. I mean, if you want to wear a mask, go ahead. I'm not going to stop you. If you if you want your kid to wear a mask, again, no problem. I don't have a, I'm not gonna stop you there either. But if I were a parent, why should I, why should I allow others to make the decision for me? I mean, I personally already don't trust the public school system. But by having these mandates in effect, we're just making the problem worse. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Kevin Jessel from uh, Berwick, Maine. I'm a husband, father of two. I've been a first responder in the past 19 as a paramedic, and I'd like to thank the school board for your service. Um, there's a lot of talk in the world about how to weigh science and who should decide when students wear masks or not. Uh, the answer is lie in peer-reviewed scientific medical journals, not internet web chats or opinion shows. Uh, COVID-19 is a public health problem everyone needs to come together to tackle. This is not a personal problem, but one that encompasses the world. When the school board followed guidelines from the CDC on mask use, they were doing their part to protect the elementary school students. The most prudent course of action is to assume we will be wearing masks at the school for the foreseeable future. I propose that we survey the students, invite them to show us areas where mask use can be improved upon. I personally have no idea what the day-to-day -day life is like for these students. I didn't have the internet um, in school when I was a kid like this. And I just, I don't envy the position that they're in. We should be working to make sure our children are comfortable and safe for the upcoming school year. If my son were, need to, were to need a break from masking, I would be delighted for him to spend some time outside without a mask for however long he needs. Um, however, I would hope that, you know, a survey of the students would identify other areas where uh, masking could be let up on the students. Um, surveys are difficult. I would encourage the school board uh, to approach all three town councils all three towns have resources where they can go out um, and improve a survey response to get a good statistical um, review to how many people you know to give us a good statistical analysis of what people actually do think not just people uh, coming in and saying you know i'm the majority you know let's actually go out and find out what it is uh, lastly i'd like to thank the school board for volunteering their time during this trying period uh, all of you should be commended for the job you are doing during this difficult time do not let a small but group Small but vocal group of people bring you down. You guys rock. Hello, my name is Jessica Brooks. I am from Lebanon. Um, 
I have three children in high school and one in elementary. Um, so one has the mask and the other three have choice. Um, and also, I'm poor parent choice. Um, like everyone else has said, they're my children. I feel like it should be my choice to uh, mask or not mask. Just like it should be my choice to vaccinate or not vaccinate. Um, also, for the buses that they have to wear the mask, the bus driver kind of gave my daughter a little bit of hard time this morning because she didn't have a mask on. If it's a mask mandate, they should be uh, where it, giving them out for the parents uh, or for the kids. I'm not going to go buy masks because I don't believe in masks. Um, so if my child does get on the bus, I feel that they should be readily available at that time. Um, and also for the pool testing, it's such a <laughs> it's a joke, <laughs> and I do not give permission to anybody. Uh, except for my child's physician to test them for COVID. Um, and I do have a daughter that just started school today that's in high school. She has severe anxiety. She was very nervous about coming to school anyway. But um, if she was to have to wear a mask, she would definitely have to have a breathing treatment because she also has asthma. So um, she would not be able to attend school if she was required to mask. Um, and I just want to say again, uh, I'm for parents' choice. Thank you. Hello, I am Alexis Adams. I am a resident of the town of Lebanon. Um, yesterday was my son's orientation. And when I was growing up, teachers showed us the classroom. They showed us where things went. They showed us where things go and all that fun stuff. My, the, his, my son's teacher was more concerned with his mask being over his nose than showing him the classroom. That is not okay. I don't care if you are for masks or not for masks. I am pregnant. I ended up with COVID. My family, entire family, was vaccinated. My son, not symptomatic at all, and has a cardiac heart defect. And, well, my second one has a cardiac heart defect. It is not fair to children to be forced to wear a mask because people are scared. I get it, COVID is real, but so is the flu. So is ammonia. So <laughs> all the other things out there. You got people are forcing us to put masks on children. Children who should be children and be able to play like children and be children. And I want my son to be able to know his friends' faces. I don't want him to know somebody behind a mask. That's not okay to me. Parents should have the right for their children to wear masks or not. And I am 100% with parents' choice. And the way teachers are, the way people are, the way school is now, I'm going to be honest. I'm disgusted. It's a disgrace. Growing up, there was way worse things that kids did. Worse than COVID. And yet, every, a lot of people are, masks protect you. No, they don't. You're poisoning children's minds from carbon dioxide. You keep those masks on the children's face all day, causing them to not be able to pay attention in school not be able to really interact with other children the way a child should be able to. Oh, 15 seconds. My, my child needs the social interaction. 
but the mask mandate is not allowing that social interaction. It's not. So I am for parents' choice. Thank you. Amy Barker. Um, I am in North Burke. Um, I worked for the district for five years, and everybody I see on the board, you know, I love everybody. It was this is nothing personal. Um, just in my experience of working with the younger kids, um, I have to say, well, last year working during COVID was one of the hardest things ever. Um, I am high risk. I um, have had an overnight surgery when I was four years old, um, and I wore the masks and. Um, it, it was horrible. It was horrible. Um, I got vaccinated, um, but I just want to say it's not as perfect as people think it is. And you can't make kids be perfect like that. They don't stay six feet apart. They don't stay three, three feet, feet apart. They don't sit forward during their lunches. They want to talk. They have their masks off. They want to see each other's faces. Um, kids would drop their masks, and before you could run across the cafeteria, they would grab their mask off a dirty floor and put it back on. They would sneeze in them. They would go and hug a friend and get scolded for it. It was the hardest thing I ever experienced. I don't work in the district anymore. I chose not to this year, um, but I just, I just feel strongly about it. My daughter was uncomfortable with it. This school has air conditioning, but other schools didn't. We didn't. We were hot. There was no fans allowed. Um, it was very difficult. It was a very long year and it was very difficult. And I just, I have to say that um, I think the school did as best as they could, but kids are kids. Little kids are little kids. They want to play, they want to see each other's faces. Kids were tripping on the fields when they were outside with masks on when it was mandatory. And they couldn't see, they couldn't, they couldn't experience life and they weren't being kids. And kids were crying that I worked with because they couldn't breathe during, um, work and they couldn't focus and some kids got lightheaded and so just on the other end of it um, I understand that there there is high risk I'm one of them but I also see the other end and I think that I feel very strong that parents have a right to be able to make a choice for their own kids change the order. And do three and four to switch three and four. If you have an agenda, we're going to switch three and four. Um, <coughs> we're going to get updates from the nurse, from Andre and Sue, and so forth on all things COVID. May I ask a procedure question? May I ask a procedure question? Yes. We're basically done, right? We've, we've set our piece. Yeah. All right. With all respect, I'm just going to go home and put my kids to bed. Thank you. Amy's presentation I have on my computer, so I'm going to call it up here. We are. You can, um, if you want to pull up this way, you can see the, the presentation. There's a, weird, fine. there's a weird echo going on. Yeah. I'm the director of nursing services for MCD60 and also the nurse, one of the nurses here at the high school. Um, Can you speak up? Yeah, I feel like yeah. Yeah. Does this help? Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just going to start um, with updates that have things that have changed since the last time we were here. 
I feel um, like I'm going to start with um, updates on the state level and then kind of zero into uh, our county level and our community, including our noble community, and then review, like we did last week, what we are being held to by the state uh, in the standard operating procedure uh, issued by the state of Maine, the DOE, in conjunction with the CDC. So this slide is from the US CDC, which color categorizes our county's risk level of community transmission. Uh, since the 24th of August, we changed over to the high level of community transmission. Next slide. <laughs> Amy, sorry, or maybe you're going to, never mind, you're okay. going to answer it here. Okay. okay, yes. So this is a description of how the community transmission levels are calculated. So it's determined by the number of positive cases per 100,000 people. This well, seems pretty changes <laughs> And I've kind of akined it to the flag at the beach. Uh, up here in Maine, our flag dangers don't quite change very often, but if you've ever been to, say, Florida or Rocker Seas, um, you kind of pay attention to the flag color before you go in water. Uh, so that's kind of what uh, it, it changes daily. So I look back, and as of the 24th, we're in the red. Next slide. This shows how the current number of cases in the state mirror the surges that we had from last January and then again in the spring. So that's kind of letting you see where we are and where we've been. Next slide. This slide shows us the last 14 day average update that was done on 826. I pulled this yesterday. I don't know that it was updated today. So this shows the history of the last 14 days of the number of cases in Maine. The total number of cases was 1626 with 336 of those confirmed cases coming from York County. So roughly about 20% of all cases in the state belong to York County. Next slide. Next, I'd like to talk about vaccinations. So according to the Maine CDC's vaccination dashboard, 71% of eligible Mainers have received their final dose, with nearly 63% of Maine's total population being fully vaccinated. Zeroing in on York County, we have 70% of our eligible population fully vaccinated and nearly 62% of our total population fully vaccinated. Next slide. Here, looking more closely at our three communities, the total percentage of vaccinated residents in North Berwick is 79%, Lebanon 54%, and Berwick at 56%. And then, next slide. As promised, the main CDC has posted the youth age 12 to 19 years old vaccination rates by SAU on the vaccination dashboard. Our district has reported 45 to 49% youth population fully vaccinated. Uh, we had put out a survey to staff several weeks ago that resulted in uh, those who responded, responded that 91% of them were fully vaccinated. Uh, we also are in the process of developing a system in which we will have to report staff vaccination um, statuses to the state. And that has to be done on a monthly basis. So I'd also kind of, we talked about this before last year, and looking back on the previous surges that we had had in the winter and then again in the spring, I kind of like to look and see how that, what that equated to in our schools. And when we were in those surges, we saw about eight cases per week of positive staff or students, which some of them required quarantining students and some of them did not 
because of the hybrid situation that we had. So say a high school student only came to us once a week. Had they been there five days a week, we probably would have had a quarantine student. Uh, we had sent out the community letter a few days ago, I believe, a handful of days ago, uh, updating on the cases that we have had in the districts. We had uh, several athletic uh, cases or individuals associated with Noble Athletics test positive before we even entered school. Um, also, a few cases from North Berwick Elementary. And then again, um, like someone had mentioned, um, on the first day of SRTC, we had several of our students exposed and are in quarantine currently. I reached out to the other nurses in the schools to kind of get an idea of how many students are currently in quarantine from home exposures and that haven't had the chance to make it to school yet. And we're about 15-ish across the district who haven't come yet. They're still in quarantine. Um, all right. Were any of those kids in the hospital? Is it? Can I ask? Sorry. I don't think we have that information. Oh, you don't know if any of the kids were hospitalized? And any of them have to go to the hospital? I probably, if I knew, I probably wouldn't oh. Oh, okay, sorry. Oh, we can know they're sick, but we can't know they're in the hospital. So the last slide we had last time, and this is where I think we get into the nuts and bolts of what we are held to in terms of having to quarantine students and the four levels of exceptions that we can apply to a level of quarantine, if that's the term. So exception number one, vaccination. If a student or staff member is fully vaccinated and they are deemed a close contact, they do not need to quarantine from school, from the community, or from other school-related activities. Exception number two, if we have laboratory confirmation of a previous COVID infection and you are considered a close contact, you don't have to quarantine from community, school, or school-related activities. Sorry, quick question. The 90 days refers to what? If you have had a previous COVID infection. Within the past 90 days? Yes. Okay. And then exception number three, if a school does pool testing and a student is determined to be a close contact, they do not have to quarantine from classroom activities or school related activities. However, they are expected to quarantine in the community. So that would mean no Girl Scouts, no grocery shopping. And then, exception number four, if a school has a mandatory masking policy, then the exposed classroom student does not need to quarantine from regular school day activities when the school close contact was at least three feet from an infected student, provided that the school enforces consistent and correct use of well-fitting masks and there was no physical contact. Now, exception number four is limited to classroom exposures only. These students may continue to come to class, but they need to quarantine from the community setting as well as from school sports and activities. Again, this is classroom exposures only. It doesn't count for the bus, it doesn't count for the lunchroom. And outside of school exposures, that, that doesn't count for this either. So if you're exposed at home, you can't come to school even though you're wearing a mask. That's, a little bit closer of a contact, a school exposure. Okay. No sense whatsoever. And then so we still held to the 10 day quarantine timeline in Maine. And this is the requirements for us if we 
regardless, right? So yeah. It's not us making this up. Yeah, this but is they're telling us that we have to do okay. Is this a good time to ask more questions on this piece? Sure. Um, do you, ha I have a couple, do you have any, is there any reasoning that a teacher would have to quarantine out of the classroom that a student wouldn't? Yeah, if they are not vaccinated and if they were with the positive student, six feet, 15 minutes of 24 hour period. Okay, so, and they would be quarantining for how long? It's okay. Sorry. Case from the last exposure. Okay. And then, what did you say? You said on going back up. You said so an unvaccinated. So the, the top half of exception four, they would not. They would not be able to ride the bus, or they they can go to class, but no sports and no bus. They can ride the bus. They can ride the bus and they can go to class. Yeah. So that is the piece where universe masking would keep kids in the classroom even if they were close contact not necessarily on the sports field but in the classroom I have a question this is what we're using for the year this is the model that this is in the standard operating procedure that is updated <coughs> as they see fit at the state level so if this is version this is new this year. Uh, this is version number seven since we began this last year. I have a question. Sure. I'm, I'm just looking at this and I'm saying, so a vaccinated person who comes in contact, are we testing them? Because some of them are coming up positive. Okay, so the recommendation from the CDC is for a vaccinated person, if they are deemed a close contact, is to test within three to five days and to wear a mask until that test comes back, well, until that test comes back negative, oh, please, negative. And if they become symptomatic, that's a whole nother bottle of wax. They should stay away. But that's at the point where somebody knows they were in contact. Yes. Correct? Yeah. So they could have already so exposed other students. Right, so if we, one of the levels, so we have a whole process. Mm -hmm. Shall I go through that? <laughs> so we, if we get notified of a positive case, we confirm it. And then we look at when the positive case was in school last. And if it was, we have to contact trace 48 hours, two days, two full days from when they were there. And we have to pull who that kiddo or staff member may have been in contact with. If we have assigned seating, which we do, we do a six foot radius from around that positive, say, student. Um, if we are in a grade level where there could perhaps be fully vaccinated students, we are able to either elicit that from a parent that they've already given us proof of vaccination we notify them, of course, if they were exposed, you're fully vaccinated, please be aware of your student. However, they do not need to quarantine. And then if we get a non-vaccinated student, then we give, we have form letters from the state with the quarantine information that they should follow. Where would we stand right now with our level of close contact and all of that clear active? Um, the football players that were exposed by another team ended their quarantine, I believe the 31st. Our SRTC students who are exposed, I believe they're quarantined until the 10th. At the end of this coming week. Yeah, so I think they can return that. Mm -hmm. Is SRTC fully, they're all masked in yeah. Sanford? At Sanford, yes. They were exposed to Sanford with the masks on? Yep. I just have, well, I, well, well, no, well, 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 well,
clearly there's, and this has nothing to do with like our school, our nurse, anything, but there's no rhyme or reason to any of this. You talk, there were other people that spoke about singling out of kids. You can't tell me that these kids aren't feeling singled out. This one's vaccinated, this one's not. They know who's been vaccinated and who hasn't been just based on who's being quarantined from the football team. It's not okay. Um, and you know, I have a kid that's a senior in high school. He is on the football team. He's already lost so much this last year and a half. All he wants to do is be in school with his friends, his teachers that he loves, his football team. He's worked his butt off. And what I have to say is these kids, whether you guys put these rules in action or not, they're getting together. They all are getting together because they've had it. And what this damage is, what damage is being done to these kids aside from this, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, um, you've already done the public input part, though. Can I say one last five-second thing? Five seconds. These, these kids, you're telling my kid that because he's in SRTC, he's on the football team, every time he has an exposure, he's going to be out for 10 days from, well, seven days from school and a sport, and that's going to restart, restart, restart every single time. He just had this interaction on a football field with a Marshwood kid that he never came in contact with. You know, so... You guys, none of this makes sense. And it's, I know it's not your decisions. I know it's not Amy. On a state level, this does not make sense anymore. But oh, well, we can't change the state. <laughs> no, we can fight for our kids so, somehow. Let's keep going. Yeah. Good. Who's going to stand up? You guys have input into this? No, no, no. Shit. They keep changing everything. Every time they turn around, they change. More questions? Can you stop? Was the survey? Out again about the I, we did say that we were going to wait until everybody gets in. Oh, okay. so there was a the, the feedback that I heard on that was that cool. a lot of people didn't necessarily see or like yeah, totally understand it. So, I mean, that's why you guys did. did. That's why we waited to, and we're going to turn it yeah. back on. I do. I mean, you guys know my feeling, but I, yeah. I think that it's a really good tool that can keep a lot of kids. Okay, that's all I'm going to do. Just a quick second, just to let people know. Um, the microphone is right there, and the people in the outside world can't hear what's going on here because there's smaller conversations. I don't want to stop the conversation. Mm -hmm. Maybe just a little bit, that might be helpful. Yep. Because um, people are texting me if they don't hear. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, keep going. Sorry. Any other questions for you? Can I, can I just clarify some? There's one yeah, other way. We can. Yeah. Yeah. We just need to keep moving. We need to keep going. Thank you. So I think we're next. AJ, AJ, did you want to? Yeah, I mean, just following up. So today was our first day, and for those that don't know me, I'm AJ Dufour, principal um, at Noble High School. So today was our first day. We had at the high school level about 95% attendance. So that puts us plus or minus 1,200 students that came through our door today. Um, and I think, and again, regardless of where, you know, there's obviously always going to be a lot of different opinions. For me, and, and for our students and our teachers, I think the ability to be in school. I know, you know, myself and, and you folks on the board, we had a lot of those conversations last year as we tried to really find ways to maximize that. And I think to Amy's point, when she goes through the, the four levels and whatnot, I just, so you guys, I think just for numbers sake, no, if we backdate those 48 hours that she talked about with close contacts, probably that's going to be somewhere between 70 and 100 close contacts, 70 and 100 individual people that a student comes in contact with. So we have five blocks a day. You're going to double that because you're going back two days and we have day one and day two classes. So now you're, you're talking over 10 blocks. A student is going to have somewhere between six to eight people within that radius with them in any classroom. So. We're starting, and again, so I'll, I'll call it 60 to 80 students. You're then going to, you know, again, if we assume that 45 to 49% vaccination, you know, I think we're looking at sending home for 10 days, 30 to 35, and again, it could be higher than that, it could be lower than that, depending on the case. They're all not gonna follow along. Every block isn't gonna follow along those lines specifically. But I think it's just the context of thinking about, like, real numbers, real people, what it would look like is important. Because I think today 
was really good at Noble High School because we had 1,200 people in the building. So I think, you know, I know our students are looking forward to football game Friday night. You know, we had a, a crowd for a cross-country meet today, which was fantastic. Um, so I think folks were antsy to get out. So that's just kind of the, the first real full day. We had our eighth graders in yesterday, um, but the first real day at Noble High School today. So just the numbers of it. And certainly if anyone has any questions, and I will say, you know, we didn't write this. It was given to us. I certainly do not agree with some of what's in here. I question it, but it's what we're being held to, like it or not. Yes, we do not love those phone calls. <laughs> That's a lot of work. <laughs> on no, it's just, it's sad, it's sad. You're on sending Mother's Day, seconds. on Easter, on the yeah. weekends. Um, Amy, you said this is the seventh version. With this, yeah. do you do you feel like this is, you know, maybe we're gonna hold on to this for like a couple of months? Like, I mean, I mean this is the seventh version in a year. Right. Probably a couple months. <laughs> Probably a couple Probably. months. I mean, maybe until yeah. winter. Okay. So I think. The way AJ said, we echo, um, we want our students here. And we really feel supporting the CDC recommendations is the way that we're going to have our best opportunity to have our students here. But, you know, my thought is I'm just like, I can't help but to look back over the last year and every single one of our meetings. And, you know, there, you know, maybe weren't a lot of people listening but like i feel like we worked so hard you know sometimes to the point of tears to just get our kids in school and i i nobody actually wants to wear a mask like it's not something that anybody wants i just feel like you know the just that it, like that was our Overwhelmingly, that was our goal last year, was to get the kids in school. And I, I personally feel like, you know, we're giving a few different opportunities to not quarantine. Kids can get vaccinated. I'm, you know, I don't know if everyone agrees, but I think the pool testing, I know it's going to be a lot to implement if we do it, but I just, I feel like it's a huge win. And it's a guarantee to keep your kid in school regardless of their vaccination status and and it sounds like you know a masking requirement is another another piece so i what well, even though i don't love many of the options i just i can't erase the last year that we spent sitting around these tables trying to figure out ways to get these kids in school so personally, I will do whatever it takes to keep them in school five days a week. In my opinion, this is how the state is trying to corner these kids into getting vaccinated and parents into making okay. our yeah, kids get vaccinated. Yeah. <laughs> it's just my, my two cents. You want to go around and just say how he feels. Yes, no, and you're right. You don't want to do this. Oh, always. I thought with my whole thing last time that the best chance of keeping the kids in school the most number of days, which is what we really need, was so bad last year. Um, that was fine. We did the problems you can see. But Um, we can't refer them to the masks. I'm in favor of you, Ms. Masks. Lynn, Kate, and 
chair. Yeah. Um, I agree that the most important thing is keeping them in school and keeping them safe. And I think yeah, it's that part of the mental level approach. Well, I didn't sit around this table last year, but I certainly um, respect the work that the board did last year. My concern is keeping the kids in school and keeping them safe, keeping our teachers safe. And following the CDC guidelines seem to give us the best opportunities to keep the schools open and keep the kids in their classrooms. Um, I'm for parent choice. I've said that from the beginning, so I'm not going to label that, labor that. But I, I, I think once they reach vaccination age, you know, that's a parental choice. You make that choice, and you also have to make the choice for masks. So, all right. I agree with Nancy. I kind of I like the parents' choice of the older kids because. They have the option to be vaccinated. The other play that I've noticed is the bullying um, seen it it would towards us in the last two weeks, right? But so my concern with is if you start making them uh, you know giving the elementary kids the choice to vaccinate the concern is that you're gonna start having more of a bullying aspect of the younger kids. For the bigger kids they can kind of I don't want to say fend for themselves, but they can they can make some choices with their parents. They can, they're old enough to really have a discussion with their parents so that they can um, have those discussions in school if they need to. So I, I, I like the idea of a parent's choice. Um, and, and I think I keep parent following CDC recommendations. And what I hear is that the CD is highly recommending that we wear masks. Our school, I just saw a sign in our school today, is highly recommended that you're wearing masks. I think um, I don't like the fact that this is being put on us as a board. I think if it was, it was something that wanted to be controlled, it should be controlled at the state level. And they're, they're pushing it down towards us, which is causing a lot of animosity for no reason. Um, I think I saw like I said, it's, to me, it's parents' choice. And it, to me, it's also following CDC's recommendation because the CDC is not mandating us to wear masks. The CDC is telling us that it's highly recommended. We're going to wish the same thing. We're going to highly recommend that people wear masks. I think one thing I want to add is I think the CDC has lost a lot of credibility in their statistics that they've been putting out personally. Um, so to me, I don't know if I would go 100% with what the CDC says right now. I do want to just agree with Travis that it, it is, it, this is not what the board the board wants to be discussing curriculum and you know other things and so i um i agree that it would be a lot easier on everyone if there was some sort of consistent something consistent that doesn't you know take up board meetings when we have a lot of other more educational <laughs> topics that we should be spending our time on so it is unfortunate and not to mention that our kids go to other schools and they come here for the uh, sports and it's just, you know, having everybody all over the place doesn't help. Um, anyways, my uh, two cents on that. I, I still feel the way I did last week with the older kids having their choice. Um, I also think that from last year, something that I really held in was um, and people don't always hear about this out in the public, so I'll just say sometimes we're contacted directly by students and um, and sometimes we're contacted by their parents, but it, it's not just always things that are put out for the public to hear. And I think there was a lot of problems for, for some kids with having to wear the masks, um, you know, caused them problems while they were here and caused them problems, you know, during the summer just trying to recover for that. And um, so... I still stay with the option of asking for the right phrase. Can I just add, though, the one thing that I want to get across is with that, uh, in my idea of the parent's choice, is the parents should understand the full gamut of things. Like you just heard tonight, if you choose to not vaccinate, you're not, not vaccinated. 
if you choose to not mask your child, they could get sent home for quarantine and not be in school for 10 days. But if you choose to mask your child, they could stay in school for 10 days. So I think that's the important aspect is, yeah. No. The whole school has to adopt universal mask oh. policy. Okay. So that can be Okay. Okay. Then I stand corrected. Then. But it is true that if they're vaccinated or we participate in full testing, that those are ways to to keep the kids. Correct. Well, I'm, last week I said it too. I'm I'm for um, family choice. Um, I I I'm, I'm not making a decision. decision on family, family, but yeah. we're yeah. making a decision on whether. This is my decision to let the families do what we want to do. Let me speak for just a minute. I'm not in any way pro mask or against them. I believe, even myself, there are times I wear it and there are times I don't. Okay, so I make my choice. But I believe that should be for everyone. And family choice is just what I'm saying is the parents and the child decide for that child. There are, there are instances where a mask can do more harm than good for a child. The parents would know that you're not a don't. Um, but I, I believe it should be their choice, um, and the reason I believe it, when the, when the CDC came out last year, is not here, I can't say, I know what you guys went through, I don't, I don't, I don't, it must have been quite the situation, but what I'm saying is, they mandated, we're supposed to be listening to them, yes, they mandated, so we had masks here, I'm sure you guys were, were, were on board on that, right now, we're listening to them, and they're saying, we are recommending you wear masks, which is what the board decided to do last and to really kind of recommend for the high schoolers. And the board decided that the younger kids that weren't able to get the vaccination to mandate. Now, that, it wasn't 100%, it wasn't all, everybody didn't agree, but that's what the majority decided. So I'm still on the same side I was that time that we should have definitely let, let um, no, no mandate. You know, I'm looking at this chart and, you know, I think Denise said, well, we don't want to have to mask kids, but we want kids in school. And one way to do that is to mask them. They won't have to quarantine if it's universal mask. Okay. No. <laughs> I mean, it but that's not 100% accurate. You don't have to quarantine, just not in the classroom. The quarantining would be dramatically different <laughs> if we have a universal policy. It'll be dramatically different. Mm -hmm. and yeah. But it wouldn't be zero. It just wouldn't be. That's zero. Not right? No. But somebody would be quarantined, especially if they're. No, classes. but a whole classroom would have to be. No, I'm just saying that. I'm, I'm just saying that not by the numbers, it right. would be. You know, it, so the possibility of the possibility to just yeah. yeah. test. I mean, you're in a classroom, you didn't have to quarantine because of close contact versus not. So, I mean, we're going to have cases. Depending on the two different people, people in that cluster test. And then you have to test positive. That's if we do full test. That's what I said. I mean, that depends if, yeah, we haven't even talked about full testing yet. but. Yeah, so the, the, universal, the impression I give of universal masking is that um, it's just a classroom that would not have to quarantine. But if that kid is still in close contact on the bus, they're going to have to quarantine. If that kid is still in close contact at the lunchroom, they're going to have to quarantine. So, yeah, so this is not, so, so Amy, a masking policy does not apply to buses, but it does apply to the classroom. Yeah, no bus. No cafeteria, okay. so that would be those two settings, or if something happened out at <coughs> recess and there was a that makes no sense. Station, then yeah. there would have to be a full blown quarantine. So if they're on the bus and there's a close contact, then they have to quarantine. So when yeah. you they have masks on the buses? Yeah, yeah. 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 that makes no sense. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I know, I know, I know, I know. This day I will start my wood stove fire 
with these documents. This has been a very frustrating process okay. across the board because I deal with it from the emergency services side. Which is different. And it's completely different than what she deals with in the school, but we're dealing with the same damn thing. Mm -hmm. I would, so how I would say. But it's all coming from the same person. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? So exactly. it's been a very frustrating process. As far as having to quarantine a whole classroom, that was version one, two, three, four, possibly. And then we moved on to the assigned seating caveat that we have, we plan to follow in all grades as much as possible. So I would hope that the days of quarantining a whole classroom, mask or no mask, are over and we have the assigned seating that we can go by six feet out from the positive case. Now I'm sure there might be instances where maybe a teacher's positive and they had contact with each and every one of those students for 15 minutes six feet within 24 hours each case is individual but that is what we are striving for mask or no mask even even with the what are we doing in the hallways are we actually traveling in the hallways we're traveling in the hallways so and that could be 12 feet away from in the classroom i'm just um could be walking side by side in the hallway that's not 16 for 15 minutes typically our hallway passings are five minutes or less there, I mean, there is no eye on every single child no nope. every minute of the day you're right it's very I mean we're, we do the best with what we have what we've been given um, what are we doing for lunch this year I know we had lunches all over the place last year what are we doing for lunches this year we are um, back using the, our cafeteria. So our, we're, we're spreading out the best we can. We have some students eating in the town square area, up above in the mezzanine area, and in the, the bulk of the students are eating in the cafeteria. I went down and utilized one of the lunches. It looks a lot busier, of course. It's right. less spread out. How are you going to be able to tell whether there's a close contact there? <laughs> um, something really just pulled my hair. Um, <laughs> What I saw today and what I've seen in years past, um, the amount of movement that happens in the high school cafeteria is such that by the time a student gets their lunch, has a seat, someone else pops up, goes to the bathroom, they mingle in town square, they come down to see the nurse. But in that <coughs> time, 20 minutes. 20 minutes. The chances are that someone's solidly with someone six feet, 15 minutes um, is pretty low. I believe that when we get a positive student upon interview with them, the parent, we can ask who we <coughs> have been around at times like that that weren't in the cafeteria to identify potential close contacts. In the grade schools, it's a heck of a lot easier. They have assigned seating spread out as much as possible. And in those cases, we will know who's sitting where, typically with their classroom, I think solidly with their classroom, anyways, and we'll know six people there. And the, this exception number four, does that pertain to our grade K through eight? Yes. Right now? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, and then the receptors. What are we doing with it? They're going recess, outside, they're unmasked, right? Unmasked, and again, if you think of the dynamics of a recess, kids are here, there, everywhere. Um, if another thing that's in the definition list is direct physical contact, so football, that case where we would have to, we had to quarantine members who played against the um, other team who could have come in direct physical contact. So say there's a scuffle on the playground and we find out three days later that one of those kids might have been positive maybe the administrator remembers the scuffle on the playground and says oh yeah so that kid's a close contact there's a lot it sounds silly but could the kids move every 15 minutes well so they're not if you've ever seen a recess they're moving oh no no in the classroom could they move seats every 15 minutes then they're never within so they're not 15 minutes within 24 hours yeah. So there's a pencil that goes through. Yeah. Um, that would add up to three rotations. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anybody have anything else? Yeah. I actually.
actually have a question. So I'm looking at the uh, one of the slides where it shows the positivity rate and the ups and downs and all that sort of thing. It would appear, and I know that's at the state level, it would appear that we're about where we were in uh, February and again in April or May. What, did that, what does that sort of curve look like right here in Z60? Are we, are, are we where we were at that same time here? Or, you know, I'm just thinking the same protocol should be in place. Right, so it's so hard saying this of, is of, day uh, cases. two of coming into school. Um, and so during those previous surges, we were seeing about eight cases that affected our schools in a week during those previous ones. This one, it, we don't know yet. I'd like to thank Rosier to adopt universal masking in all of our schools. Eight and twelve. I'll stop at that. Second. Okay. Any other discussion? I, I do have one other question before we take a vote. The obviously SRTC's quarantining thing looks the same. Um, do they, has there been any communication with Sanford? Like, how does, so our kids have to wear masks when they're there? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So, Right, so they're following the exception why, four. Why do we have to park in our kids? So, maybe should <laughs> Yeah, I feel like we have to it. So, it's my understanding that our students were quarantined because there was no assigned seating happening. If you think of the nature of an SRTCC program, they were working closely together. But their kids did not have to quarantine? They did. They did have to yeah. quarantine. So it's, even though they have a universal mask policy. Yes, yeah, so they kind of, it's universal masking, assigned seats, keeping them relatively three feet apart. So the clustering in the classroom probably happened. But then let's ask the question, why would they be forced to ride a bus altogether? Like, why wouldn't you guys want them to be able to drive to school? Well, so, so I guess if we get to that. Yeah, Amy, what I'm wondering about my list is, like, so does our decision, does it have any impact on the SRT, SRTC kids? Like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, so I think what we heard back was it was the nature of the program, so whatever they were doing. So, I, and again, I don't pretend that it's, not, it's, it's way easier for us to control the environment of the classroom setting that we have versus the hands-on nature. So, and again, because I believe it was the first day or one of the first couple days, I don't know if it was looking at equipment. I don't know what spurred there to be all of those close contacts. It certainly was not classroom work that they were doing. So I think the nature of the activity is what caused there to be that many close contacts. They may that figure that out and come up with a structure that would yes. maybe yep. I think you know if it were a program where you know two students are working on a robotic so it might be if, if one of those two were to test positive maybe the partner even with universal masking would be considered a close contact but I don't think I don't think it would be typical to be an entire program like I believe it was pretty close to an entire program And then also, sorry, before we vote, um, I guess, I don't know if you can amend the um, recommendation, um, but I do think it's something that we need to revisit. You know, I don't want to do it every week, but if we could watch the rates, you know, and 
That was part of the class. Well, I mean, that's basically what you want to do. Yeah, but I don't want to be, I don't want us to be like voting on it every week. But I, no. but I think that part of whatever we put in place or don't put in place, I, I just, I think that we need to watch the numbers and revisit and be one of my concerns last year is that we were not ready to make a decision when information changed. And so I would like us to be a little more ready this year to be able to make a decision. And if the numbers really are going down, to not be afraid to take that into consideration. And if they go up, to not be afraid to take that into consideration. So whatever we're basing our votes on, you know, if that changes, I'd like to see as a board us be able to, you know, to revisit a little bit more quickly than we were able to last year. Well, we've done it now, so we know that. <laughs> well, I think, the routine. I think we're going to get an update every day. On our agenda, an update every single week. Uh, I don't necessarily think we have to sit here and say that we're going to vote on it every single week. Mm -hmm. I think it's, if we get updated with a bunch of information that sways us one way or the other, that's when we end up voting on it in my mind. Because <clears throat> change is daily. Any other discussion before we vote? Yes. Can you take a roll call? Can you take a roll call? Sure. Yeah. 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 Huh? Because you want to what? Know who voted which way? Is that right. what you mean? Right. Well, I know. Yeah. I'm sure there are people that voted for that. And we can note that in ten minutes. So you want to go around each person vote, or just do the names and write their names? Can we just repeat the motion one more time before we close? And do you want me to amend it to add that language? I don't think you need to. I, I guess not. not. If we're really going to revisit it, yeah. yeah. So I'd like to make an, a motion to amend our decision of two weeks ago and mandate mass, universal masking for students, staff, and faculty in K through 12. So how do you want, do you want us to raise our hands or do you want to go around? Which is easy to do. You need to sign it in. Are we still signing it? Linda? Yeah. Okay, all those in favor of the motion? Raise your hand. Thank you. Denise? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Did you say opposed? Did you say opposed? I did, sorry. Clearly opposed. Yep, this is opposed. Okay. All right, so that is a motion passed. We took away parents' choice because a couple kids get sick, they're not in the hospital, they're not dying, and you took away a parent's choice to make medical decisions for their kid. That's disgusting. They may not be they're sick, they're not in the hospital, they're not dying. Now it's not the time. Please, I've got the time. That's ridiculous. No comments, please. We can't ask people. We can't ask people. We can't ask people. We're going to encourage kids to protest a lot. Okay. Hold on. I stuff to do. If we're asking them to not interact with us, don't get to do it right back. That's all I was saying. So we should listen to you. All right, minutes. Bazillion of these. I apologize. Everything, the August 19th minutes are not there. I saw the I'm still trying to all of these other issues. Does the masking apply to only in the building or is it anywhere on school grounds? I'm just curious. Um, it's inside. Yeah, actually, inside, it's inside the building. It's in okay. So the outside for that remark is to be recess and other Right, okay, thank you. I do not have access to June 13th. It came quite a while ago. No, it just says I don't have access, but I do have June 17th. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you need help in math, you can call me. Thank you so much. Okay, anybody see any errors? Session, 
Paragraph nominations yeah, of the new board chair. The student report to two not Yeah. Uh, I also noted on. Um, I need to make a motion of assessment somewhere here. On the seventeenth. Yeah. Um, you need to make a motion of the second and find this high. Yeah. Second page. No, very well. The very bottom, the first page for me. Uh, the board discussed the warrant for the assessment of taxes based on the approved budget. And um, is now in the motion second by Ms. Hagenbach. The warrant for the assessment of taxes was approved by the board. Um, I, I, hold on. I thought I said there was a little. No vote, but it says it's approved by the board. So nothing wrong with it, apparently. <laughs> I'm going to say that it's in mail when I read these earlier. And the other thing I had on that one. Um, that was when we appointed AJ. See that got fixed. While you're finding that, can I just do a quick thing? This, I wasn't sure if you were supposed to put the student IDs in there. That was the student ID in there? Yeah, for the presentation. Okay. Uh, I don't know. Yes, yes. Oh, right. I know the rules okay. are that's all. Okay. Um, good. Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll follow up with that. And you can show me a hyperlink there. That's why I changed the name. Uh, but my vote or my thing was that when we appointed uh, Mr. Dupart to be principal, it says that it was point, appointed for a principal for the meeting. So we only appointed him to be principal okay. for the meeting. Okay. I'm pretty sure okay. it was we appointed him for a year. Interim. Yeah. What do you think? Any others? One, Corrections? And then check on the student name. Okay, then. Somebody want to make a motion as amended? I'll make a motion to accept the minutes as amended. I'll second it. Uh, all those in favor? Are you abstaining out? I wasn't, I wasn't here. I wasn't here. Oh, okay, all right. Yeah. All right, June 30th. Very short. <laughs> this is a short one. I'll make a motion to accept this one. I didn't notice any. Audrey, you ready to get a motion? I am. Did you make a motion? I made a motion. I made a motion to accept it. Okay. All those in favor? 
Oh, never mind, I wasn't there. She wasn't there, so... I really thought I was. Sorry, which one are we on? July 22nd. It says you weren't there. I know, I will not have it. Does anybody want to make up the motion? I guess there's nothing in there that's wrong. Make motion to Oh, she made the motion. Okay, <laughs> second. Um, all those in favor? Yeah. Yep. Okay, August 5th. Uh, any question? Something about. Oh, and like the fourth paragraph, the complete when she's talking, it says that and it currently is recommended that all staff and students in K through 13. I missed that one. We're in here. Yep, we're in the year. Yep, we're in the year. The whole of the year. I'm glad my daughter left. <laughs> when I was in high school in Canada, we went through grade 13. Really? Canada. <laughs> <laughs> it ended the year, I actually graduated from grade 12 because I was in the U.S. at that point, but it ended the year I would have graduated from grade 13. Anything else? That was all I noticed. Okay. So I'll make a motion to accept it as amended. Second. 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 And that's it, because we're going to get the 19th next week. So, yes. Who did, who seconded that one? Uh, oh, that oh, okay. that oh yeah. thank you. Um, what has happened that caused the case of our mind? Summer. Um, because I, because it, it's difficult to go back yes, and remember yeah, that going there well over a month. Yes, so and they've had a lot to do with the office. Two weeks. I totally get that. But it would be nice to get this on the website. Yes. 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 Okay. Okie dokie. Okay. Um, I don't know. Enrolling. Open date. I just do it. Open day. Open day. I just. I don't know if it's easier for you to look at enrollment. I wrote that. Just so oh, okay. there's a lot of other information. So I wanted to just make sure you have this. And what I did, um, as you can see, our last, I, I took March. Did you see that? Okay. So March, you know, last year we were all over the place with people in the remote, out of remote, mm -hmm. in the uh, Home school, out of home school. Yeah. So the last, I, I compared this to March, March first, 2020, was when we took the last um, in school, like physically present enrollments. So that's on the right hand side, okay. and then this is September 2nd as of today. If you so just. Now, no, crazy that the numbers are all over the place, but the total is just is pretty similar. Yes, yeah. I just want to yes. different size classes have something to do with that too. Right, right. There was a bubble that went up to the high school that left the middle school. Um, North Berwick, if you look at North Berwick, has uh, uh, just going to have the the, the honey school, the middle school, the Anton school, and all the elementary all went down, yes. but North Berwick went up by thirty six. Yes. Wow, I'm surprised we went. Middle school went down. 
I'm sorry, 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 I'm
different people in the villages at one time is tough, and that is a huge attendance. You know, so we are doing. Um, the students are participating in creating the um, open house for the families, and they'll have uh, be able to see it online. That's all. All the schools, so it's not just one building versus another. The building meeting. I don't know how large that's going to be. Like here, it wasn't very large. I so we hope know, it's large. Well, I mean, the right. Large town. The right. problem was the, the reason why we were piggybacking what we were piggybacking right. was to get that yeah, large. Right. right. If we're not going to be able to piggyback them, <coughs> that would be the purpose of what I hope was there. But we but we, we had to do schedule, but, and, but we didn't schedule them on open house nights anyway. Oh, okay. We did no, yeah, we did. not we scheduled them not to be on open house nights. We yeah. talked about open house nights. I, yeah. I, I thought we scheduled They were scheduled for the open house was on the 16th. Oh, you know what I mean? It was to post the, the board up. Right. For, so right. the board right. Yeah. Right. the open house aspect. Yeah. And so they do the list of the boards when they come right. in. Okay, so one of the dates we scheduled for the Instruction meeting still going on. Yes, yes. Okay. I don't anticipate it's going to be that many students and that many parents right. coming for those. Okay. So I think we're in pretty good shape. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I think. Yes. Sure. Last year we did the mass and we had one provision in the books that people can ask conditions to come for mass for each year. Yes. Is that going to be the same still, or do we have to vote on that one? I believe that should be the same. Because the mass provision is the same. Yeah. Just yeah. 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 making sure that that's still part yeah. of yeah. that was brought up. Yeah. Do you have those dates? To go back on the building thing, how are, as far as Paul has said, how are the lighting building meeting is on the 8th. At six o'clock. Yes. Uh, our North Earth building meeting is on the night at six o'clock. Yes. And our Hundy building meeting is on the 13th at six o'clock. Correct. And that's when we're going to review the plan and the data for the upcoming vote in November. Right. Right. And what just one that one building where we are? Yes. It did, BCTV um, was there for the last presentation. Yep. They did some follow up with me and it's going on the BCTV. They're gonna run it a couple of times. It's on our district site, the three presentation. Um, and then we'll continue to provide updates as they come in. I don't know where I had it, but I thought I had it open as the 21st. So the 8th? No, it's the 8th. The, 20, the 21st is the budget hearing. Oh the the hearing, the bond hearing. Oh gosh, okay. Because then in November we vote. Okay. The town's vote. Okay. September 21st. Oh, wow. No, 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 um, CAJ, the architects, the architectural firms, um, coming up with a, a flyer, like a big, a bigger flyer that would have all three of the projects and show the plans on the projects, and that would be mailed to everybody, all the community members. Which I really hope we get this time. I know. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> do we have the uh, bulletin boards and stuff out there already? We have bulletin boards. They've been. Are they at the schools? I'm just trying. To think. Uh, I don't know that they are. She has to say it's a little bit about that. So I think that's it. Um, I have a, the other. Mm -hmm. Can we? Well, we're not at all. Well, are we? No, we're not at all. There's not another, but we're allowed to just for you. <laughs> <laughs> Get left on. Did it? Okay. Second reading of the policy. I have the hard copies of the policy, and I know we just kind of want to walk through it. Yeah. If you could just pass it down, they're not all. Is it two pages? It is two pages. Hard. Yes.
So, okay, so just so I'm clear, we're doing this because we didn't previously have a remote policy, but there was a whatever emergency policy in place that expired. So we have written our own policy basically to be able to perform. Right. They said we had to do this legally for anybody who was good on remote could vote. Right. Um, earlier this week. The um, Lynn, Stephanie, and I met, and we went through that as our policy committee right now. And we went through this and just made some changes. You'll see some strike throughs. Those were suggested changes. Um, Fun fact practicable is a word. Is that correct? I was going to say, you know, I said, I wasn't sure. Do you know how people do like the mashups of words? Yeah. It sounded like one of those mashup words. Um, so we, we had looked at making just the word practical, even the practical is word. Um, because of that, the sentence down below, if we're going to change it to practical, that sentence below where it starts with yes. circumstances should be too. Mm -hmm. um, we, we talked earlier about that the care talk on the back of the first page, all that stuff was crossed out. We talked about putting you're going to allow uh, email to put public input 24 hours in advance. Do we want to put a link on that or just keep it in the three minutes it takes to read it? Or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, because we have a three, three minute limit if somebody is speaking here. So they all email it in and they're like you know. last time, quite lengthy. So. I think we should do the, the so I think the three minutes should be there. Or we just want to get rid of the link when we already have in person meetings. Right, that's what we talked about, right? True. I don't, I don't mind. But I mean, this is for when we're doing remote meetings. When we're doing, yeah, I don't, if, if we're doing remote meetings, like we're fully remote, I think we need to do three minutes. Right. Background. I'm just saying, I think maybe we should put it in. Because it's in there for the regular. Do you want us to put that in? I don't, I don't, I don't know where you put it, but we will. We'll. Okay. Maybe just after that sentence, prior to this, start of the meeting to be read during the meeting, and then put comments should not exceed three minutes. Or to be submitted 24 hours in advance and not exceed. Yeah, I can put it in there too. Anybody have anything else? Travis, did you find what you were thinking of for work? Uh, yeah, we um, were working. Yeah, so I, you know, I guess the question is the interpretation. Uh, the uh, circumstances with which physical presence is closing in is not practical to include. So, you know, it kind of can be part of the policy. And in order to be remote, you have to have an existence of an emergency. Um, and that explains the emergency are The question becomes is, is are we going to limit it to just those circumstances? Or if for some reason all of us is on vacation and we decide we want to build a world we're all in to, to the board meeting, can we allow them to still have hope? Do we well, take advantage of this new technology or do we go to in person? Well, I mean, this under lead number two, there's yeah. that index that says um, prior notice of the board's members absent, it should be indicated that they want to cruise. Participate remotely and should communicate to the board chair as far in advance as the meeting is practical. Okay. Practical. Okay. Oh, practical. Oh, that's another one. Okay. 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 I do like the word practical. It's a real one? Yeah. It's not. It's actually is appropriate. Okay. So I don't know oh if that. Yes, it's temporary absence from the area. If yeah, you look right. right. I think that's one that covers it. It would to me, but. I just want to make sure that we're all on the same 
motion. I would like to make a motion that we. What, what is it that I'm actually motioning? Approve, Approve the nomination of Lauren Lazar for assistant athletic director. Second. Second. All those in favor? Oh, can I just make a request that? I don't know if we've asked for this in the past, but uh, when we have a measure position, I'd like to see it based on. Okay. Right. You'd like to yeah. see the yeah. yeah. point like because the administrator's position. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. the teacher's case too, when we that that's going to be a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Sure. But definitely yeah. administrator's All right. Next, employment. And I love that you listed everybody this okay. time. Good. A little more ahead of us. Sometimes it's like two minutes before we have. I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. I know. But I really like that. You know, yeah. you made it. Is that a big <laughs> I was just on the street tonight. <laughs> okay, so these are um, our new hires that have already started. <laughs> um, but we have today was the last day of the um, ability for us to extend um, contracts up to TJ staff. It goes back to the board after this week. So, um, so these are our new hires Tamara Davis, who's Noble Middle School Spanish. And that may come as a little bit of a surprise because we haven't had Spanish at um, the middle school. And this is, we had a position, somebody will get loud. Yeah, okay. Okay, so yeah. So anyway, so, right. yeah, so Tamara is taking, somebody retired. Yeah. The position was never filled last year, right? So this is going in as a, as a global, like a, yeah, as a global, 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 global rotation. Right. So we're getting we're getting the opportunity to have a uh, foreign language at the element at the middle school, yeah, which we haven't had in this many years. So it's plus, yeah. And she has a degree in um, law. So and uh, yes, <laughs> and uh, has done some real estate okay, in, in, the, in the area, and is just very much looking forward to. We have Lori Coleman, who is coming in as a Lebanon school counselor. She graduated from USM. She was excelled in Stanford. So, 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 I'm going to give you a little background on her. Lori Coleman was the last Spanish teacher we had at Noble Middle School. Really? Yeah, so then she left and went to Stanford for other reasons. But she, that was when we lost Spanish, was when Lori went over there. Oh. <laughs> so she's coming back That's in a different capacity. Yeah. yeah. And then Jesse Sears for Multiple Pathways Health and PE. That's Jim Winslow. When Jim moved over to um, assistant principal, that was Jim's position. So Jesse graduated from UNH and was most currently in Wadian. John Hall, this is the exact same name as John Hall at the middle school. Oh, so, and I said to myself, good, I think the other one's Yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right. So this is for social studies, and John graduated. Yeah, he was. Yeah. So he's graduated from USM, and he was in Kennebec Community College and YCCC. So he was the he's the actual was the dual enrollment coordinator for YCCC and Noble, and he's fabulous. We're really lucky to get him to teach any taught um, history at YCCC. And then we have Maria Cannon, um, graduated from graduated from UNH. I think she's still getting her certificate of advanced degree from UNH. She was most recently at the art school in Massachusetts, and she's a literacy coach at the high school. We have Camilla Shaw from Knowlton, grade five, and she's a recent graduate of Kingston College. We have Crystal Hansen, who's a special education teacher at Knowlton School. She graduated from the State University and was at Dover Middle School. We have Jeremy Prong, Noble High School social studies teacher. He graduated from the University of New England. He uh, most recently was at Mahoney Middle School. That was a one year only position. We have Tim Protzman, uh, Noble High School multiple pathways English teacher. He graduated from UNH. He most recently was working in at the Shanghai American School. In and Shanghai. Yes, and then we located back here um, due to uh, COVID. People uh, live in South Berwick, so they're back in South Berwick. And then our most recent hire is Kayla Peard, Nova High School Band. 
She graduated from UNH. She is Falmouth High School in Massachusetts currently, and she is looking to relocate back here. So she's scheduled to start the end of next week or the beginning She'll of the week. She'll be on the 13th. She'll be here the 13th. And then Barbara Schwartz, who is a longtime um, educational technician at Knowlton School. She was at Hussey School for a little while. She has extensive work she, in, when she was in her, before she came to Maine. Um, and she is going to be taking over for special education as a case manager, a resource teacher. Um, she has her certificate, her emergency certificate, we should say, for that. Um, so those are our hires that we've already had. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. we don't need we don't, we don't, we don't, we don't need a motion on those. Correct. And then we have a resignation, and that's Carissa Sear, and she was middle school special education. She went to Wells. Mm -hmm. going to Wells. And then we have two uh, recent retirements. Jeff Patton for 25 years history at Hill High School. And Mark Mamey, 26 years for um, a high school music. Mm -hmm. And those, we do need um, a motion for those to accept the regrets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll make a motion to accept with regrets. I know my son had both of them. Mm -hmm. They're both fabulous teachers. So. I'll second that. Second, Travis. No, just for the retirement. Just for the retirement. And are they already retired? Are they? Like, have they finished? They were. Yeah. Yep. They yeah. They, they put their letters of retirement in and. Yeah. Yeah. And um, all those in favor? With regrets again. So we'll see what they want and maybe they have to come back. <laughs> 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 they're gone. So far, nobody's ever done that. Do we have to do something for the resignation? We do. A different one? Yes. Okay. We need about so, separate. I don't want to do the resignation. That was second. Yeah. All in favor? Others. I've got a couple of COVID others. I should have asked them. Okay. Um, so the, the person that was talking about the SRTC kids have to ride on the bus. Yeah, we'll follow that, that. I assume is that a, that's all the districts right. on so that. that? Right. So that's is that right. open? Are people are, is, are the districts open to revisiting that? So that's that is a question. I told Mr. Mulligan that we will. I will bring that back to the because yeah, it doesn't the yeah, vote. Really doesn't doesn't make sense. Sense. Unless right. there's something that we're not going to do. Well, there was one that was saying they do have a serious yeah. part. So, so originally, Stanford has never allowed our students to drive to vote. Last year, it was allowed because of the COVID situation, and that just eliminated all the problems in terms of busing. And then, then they rolled it back to the original piece, which is we don't really have a lot of parking, extra parking for kids to come in from all the other districts. So that's really what this is about. Um, and we can, you know, we'll bring it to the visit vocational board so they can talk about that. Um, if there's anything, um, like a, and if an exception can be made, we certainly will talk to um, the folks at Sanford as to what that exception is and then how the relevance can try to meet that exception. But uh, that's really, it's, there's some history here that. I wouldn't think it'd be just a relevance. I mean, it, is, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to force our kids to ride a bus. I mean, if we are not going all masking and all these schools, yeah. we're still sort of in the COVID. We very much yeah. are in the COVID. I understand. I, I think this is just, this is really, uh, this is a Sanford sort of situation in terms of the busing. The other part, just to be honest with you, is the liability of our kids driving to school. But it, it's, it's like during the school day piece, it's just one more additional yeah. sort of concern about kids in cars driving. So, no, I get that, yeah. but one of the conversations that like is still so with me from last year was that we couldn't put other kids yeah. here back in school because the kids had to drive to and from. Yeah. And that was like that ruled yeah, no. really so many of our choices. And so yeah. like it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me from a sort of COVID standpoint. I do get it from a parking and sort of consistency standpoint, but you know, it's yeah. yeah. I think honestly some of this is just 
it's really, we have that, that on here in between where things are opened up a lot more to, they want to go back to the older requirements as well. So we'll, we'll talk about it, I guess. I don't know that we'll, I don't know we're okay with it, but we'll talk about it for sure. Um, now, someone said something about there's absolutely going to be no remote learning going on. Now, I didn't understand that to be true. Right? So we have currently. Oh, sorry. We have three students, potentially four students, remote at Noble High School. We have kindergarten to fifth grade across the district, seven families, or seven students, not even families, seven students, which turns out to be like three or four families that are participating in remote learning. There are none at Noble Middle School because we've got them at the Noble Middle School. Well, so that's what we have so cool. out, of, out of all of our students. But is that a choice that they're making? They can make a choice based, based on health factors that we covered last right, last time, that if there was a health factor or a health concern, something I know from the doctor, yes, or that we would honor that, but it, it was not going to look exactly like it did last year because um, across the state, no schools are are doing the kind of remote that we did last, last year. year. So I met with um, the salary after, after the meeting, well, in between, and I'll talk with with AJ about, like, I, she's asked, I think he's, she's been offered several options, and I don't know that they meet her needs right now, or her, what she thinks is the best need for her daughter. So we're just, out, it's an individual thing, we'll sit down and talk about that. Oh, uh, just my, and yeah, that's completely something different, but my concern was that we did have remote options, and we no, do we have the ability, we yes. have all the technology to do remote stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh. It sounds like it's, um, well, we do at the high school. Well, so it's not we don't have the technology in the other schools to do it, correct? Yeah. Is that correct? So, hey, AJ, do you want to talk a little bit about, like, if you had to quarantine 10 sure. children or 5 children from a class? Yeah. 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 Well, well, like, not even just a table. What are we doing? What are we doing? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, so at the high school level, um, so we still have a number of our classrooms. I think the last number was 22 that don't have the technology here either. Because last year, the reason we had the technology, we used all the double classrooms. So now with closing those walls, only one of the two classrooms have it. But in the event that students are quarantined, we are going to be able to do really short term remote to those kids that, are, that we have put in quarantine, if you will, not that it was us doing it to them, but they met the qualifications of quarantine due to COVID. We want to continue them with their education, but it's, it is going to be relatively short term because, you know, generally speaking, if a student tests positive, it's going to take a couple of days since the actual exposure before we find out that someone tested positive. So usually a student would have seven or eight days left in their quarantine. So we'll do three or four days of each day ones and day twos with them being able to log on remotely so they can keep up with their class and then when they come back in person after the 10 days are up. Are they going to be able to log into their, their class after their class? For the short term students, yes. So yep. well, basically you need to equip every classroom we're, across the district with the ability to go remote at any time. We're working on it, yes. Is that what we want to do? Well, I mean, I think we want to be able to continue to offer the class. I mean, because a student could be in December when they're, you know, determined to have to quarantine for the first time. We don't want them to miss what could be up as far, you know, it won't be quite two weeks of school because of weekends and whatnot, but we don't want them to miss that time. i got to admit, I'm, I'm shocked that we are going down this road. Yeah, I mean, I think I, there's no, so what we're not doing, and we're working individually families we're not starting a student out on day one of the year saying you are always going to log in it is a but isn't this isn't this like a tremendous amount of work for that teacher well i mean our hope is i mean and not to turn it on tonight hopefully our number of quarantines are down tremendously based on the masking i mean truthfully that factors into it that there should be you know now if a student tests positive we're maybe talking two or three related to that one that would need to quarantine from school. So the numbers 
should be. We've also cohorted our students. Honestly, it doesn't really matter what the number is. Like either you're turning you're turning a classroom into a remote teaching or you're not. It doesn't matter if it's one kid on the other end or ten. Right, but it matters if it's one time every so often for two or three classes versus every so every single this day. This, can this technology be gold from room to room? Is that what you're saying? Nope. No. no. And is it just for core classes? It's for all, all classes? All classes. And what if the science uh, history teacher's room is not equipped for that? Yeah, so I mean, a lot of our teachers are using, so again, and we have told teachers it's not going to be perfect. So our teachers are already using Google Classroom. So the student, it may be a situation, unfortunately, if the technology is such where the student can hear and listen to what's going on in the classroom, they have the PowerPoint, I'm dating myself, you know, the, the slideshow that's being presented at the front of the room. They can watch that on their own screen at home. They can listen to what's happening. But it's, the focus is going to be on in-person learning because that, so it won't be, you, you know, I think what we're hoping is that when the student comes back from quarantine, Maybe they have to stay after school one day to get caught up versus needing to stay after school four days to get caught up because that's just a lot for a student. So it's going to be the focus is in person with allowing the student to access and still, you know, again, it wouldn't work for a student to do that for the entire semester, but it, it should work to keep the student afloat during the mandatory quarantine period because otherwise they're out. And is that, well, they shouldn't complain about it now. They're all universally masked. So there shouldn't be any complaining about, oh, I have to go and go out for about 10 days or whatever. No. You know. I mean, I, I'm just thinking about the, the feedback from the teachers last year and I, like, how incredibly difficult and taxing that was to do those dual classrooms and, yep. like, and it was, I, don't know, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm just very surprised to hear that this is going to be easy to implement. Right. I think the it, the big difference, honestly, is that the script is flipped based on the focus. So our focus last year was trying to do both really, really well. And it's hard. I mean, I, I would dare say it's nearly impossible to do both well. The focus this year is it's your in-person learners. It's like someone on the outside being able to essentially listen in and keep up. It's not, you know, again, I don't pretend it's going to be great, so I will apologize for that in advance. So they're not completely in the dark. So exactly. The, and it happens, like, so when my daughter was a long time ago in the eighth and ninth grade, she had knee surgery on both knees, and she was out for six weeks on each of them. She had a little, it was a little robot. Like a robot. <laughs> and that's more of what it's like. It's, yeah. like. it's more about being able to access the in-person piece of it as much as, I mean, the in-class piece of it. Right, yeah, I mean, because we had folks, and again, did an unbelievable job, I can't, you know, but they were putting the people at home into groups with people that were in the classroom and trying to, like, trying to meld both worlds, and it's it's really, really hard, and we've been really clear that, that we were super appreciative of that, but it's not sustainable to that level, so it's now going to be more like they're able to keep up, and that's our hope. Just is, a, is just it going to be open to somebody who's just sick at home with a cold? No. Nope. The, the link to class is only going to be shared out. And I think that's the other part of the feedback we got, and folks were spot on. You never knew day to day who was going to be where. Yeah. So when the student wasn't in front of you, now you're looking on the computer to try and find them. Are they there? Are they not there? Where? So now the teacher will be notified that yep. such and such a student is in quarantine. They get a link. Yep. But someone else who's sick doesn't get one. Exactly. And, and truthfully, the other piece is, and we're going to be very clear when a student goes into quarantine, oftentimes there may be lead time to make that happen. Because if I'm making that call to the family at 8 o'clock tonight in their school tomorrow, I don't think it's fair to expect that block one at 740, the link's going to be had. In the, like, but it's okay. Students are sometimes absent for a day. That happens. What I don't want to do is sort of, we don't want to require a student to be absent for the four, four day ones that happen with no learning during that time. Would it be option or an option for extended absences? Like that situation there? Like, I, I yeah, I mean, it would be case by case. I think at this point, we're trying to be really clear with it being COVID related, yeah. just to put some parameters because otherwise it becomes tricky. But we, we are working with families um, 
around other remote opportunities. I think one of the advantages we have, especially for our older students, is being able to offer York County Community College classes um, that have been really, really beneficial for a lot of our juniors and seniors. And we actually have a couple of sophomores that are like, can I try one? I really want to try. And families have been really receptive. Um, and, and Sue mentioned it during the nomination of John Hall, the our John Hall, um, with him, con you know, I think he's going to try and continue to be an adjunct and teach a class every great once in a while at YCCC. It's going to be a really huge ally. So, like, I have a, a couple of kiddos who were scheduled to have him that Audra spoke about that have a medical condition that won't allow them to come in. They can take YCCC history with the same teacher that they would have had at Noble High School history. So it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good thing that we can offer. So we're not offering it for a year-long program for somebody who doesn't want to come to school like No. And you said it's not movable from classroom to classroom, but it can be removed, right? No, it's set to the classroom. The, 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 the eye in the sky, special camera, microphone. Uh, later on, I'm looking at it from if we are getting rid of Lebanon Elementary, can we take the stuff out of there? I would think so. I would think so. Yeah, I don't. The elementary stuff is is different than the installs here at the high school. They're more flexible and movable between classrooms. Yeah. And one last comment. So at the lower levels, we have two options that that could happen, and again, some of it's a case by case basis, but. If somebody needs to quarantine, we, we have a facilitator, a teacher facilitator, that's doing K-5 with seven students. So if there was a situation where somebody had to quarantine, that facilitator would be the check-in person for that student. And the teacher would supply the work, similar to like if somebody goes out for an extended time, the teacher provides the work. Mm -hmm. um, but this person would be the check-in person so that the teacher doesn't have to kind of run a dual piece here. Um, so that's that's what we're looking at for the local ones. And then it's a little school thing kind of sad because we have the remote options right. as well. So what are those I think it's gonna be a little harder to kind of try to get them into the virtual academy mm -hmm. because yeah. of yeah. 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 So, so we want those kids really get quarantined. So, we're gonna work to swing it the same way. I think they don't have the same level of technologies that we have up here set up wise. So I mean they have all the computers but they don't have the same kind of unkidding classroom. So we'll we'll talk about it a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Depending on grades. Yeah, so there's a legal grade span too that you can only have somebody in your classroom grade like a a de or uh, a width of grade span. So we'll have to check that out. Um, I have to be honest with you, I'm sure that they have a plan because I just I think I've lost it in all of this other stuff. This thing going on. I think we'll... they don't have extra masks on the buses. Now, I don't think we should, we should be supplying each other with masks yeah. every day because I'm surprised by that, honestly. So we'll follow up because yeah. they should. Right. Yeah. 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 But it sounds like. Well, they should. Well, they should. Well, they should. Well, they should. But then again, I don't want every day it's a this, you know what I mean? So I don't know how you do that. Yeah. Have to yeah. I had another quick other, and we can think about it for the future or whatever, but um, cafeteria uh, workers. I heard some stuff um, just that I think that's being put out there asking us if we could maybe accept the plastic masks that come from below. And go up, in other words, so they wouldn't uh, be able to get anything. I, I, I for the just, workers, you mean? For the workers. I just heard a few things about uh, the heat when they're working, okay. and that um, I think people, when they when there's less people in there, or potentially like a very low number, if they were able to spread and then be able to put that on uh, to make it nicer for them. It's interesting you say that because Sanford started with that policy, and it, it, they wanted universal masking for the kids. But yeah. The teachers, if they were just teachers in the room, or if they were by themselves, they could take the mask up. They got done. they got rid of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the plastic ones that go up. Yeah, and just like putting it out there as a, as a maybe as a thing. Um, and then so we typically do make accommodations for folks that need them based on a multiple like like we allow shields and stuff. 
So let's talk. We'll, I'll, we'll talk to Abby and see what she does for that. Okay. Yeah. And in that same uh, idea with the whole plastic mask thing, with the younger grades when teachers are reading, and they're maybe they can like go to right where the chalkboard is and have that distance between the kids and desks. Is you know is that something that we maybe want to do so then the kids can see the teacher's face or leave it like we have it? Like I'm just throwing it out there kind of thing. I, I wondered that too. What getting readers and they need to yeah. see the mouth of the. Yeah, I wonder if that would be helpful. There are clear masks. Yes, we have clear masks. Oh, yes, for that very thing. And there are clear masks. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any way we can see one of those maybe the next board meeting just so that we can see what that actually short logistically looks like? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And according to Ms. Craven's, our transportation director, there are extra masks on the buses. Hmm. So we'll follow up. I will just tell her that they have someone who. Anybody else have any others? I do. Um, we had talked at the beginning of the summer about um, either, I can't remember exactly how we left it, but either setting up a workshop or inviting the, I also can't remember the official name of it, but the, the diversity committee. Uh -huh. I'm sort of hearing secondhand that there's some frustration that they feel like they're getting stopped from meeting with the board. Um, I know we had talked about getting something on the calendar, so I'd like to just... September 16th. Mm -hmm. More or less. <laughs> September 16th? Yes. That's the next meeting, right? What's that? That's, 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 that's the next meeting. That's the NFC, which is the... They're coming to you. Yes. Great. Because I'm in love with here. Okay. Would be great. I'm in love with you. Oh, okay. um, <laughs> and correct me if I'm wrong, the September 1st, that the state law went into play on mm -hmm. uh, the, man, the mandated vaccine. I saw in one of the minutes we had said that there was like 100 kids that were missing something within those parts. We'll get you an update on Where that. Where are we uh, with, okay. with those kids? That, uh, Do we have any issues with them not being here? Have you had any conversation with Amy about that? I have, yeah. The number is rapid going down so that's a good thing um, and we're at a point right now where I think and I don't know the, the number of days but there is a, a grace period that's allowed if a family has made an appointment and we have most of our families in that queue the, the test is going to be like confirming that that was an actual appointment that resulted in said vaccination you know it's so that's where we're at. So most families have been very receptive to it and have said um, they'll do it. Amy did a great job. I know she was able to secure um, some of the vaccine right in the office oh. with the ability to administer it. So that was hugely helpful. And I know she even started that process during um, fall sports preseason so that students were taken care of prior. So I think we're in much better shape than that number, but it's, it's a constant is it more at the high school that you have the problem or more at the younger kids? The numbers were higher at the high school. Yeah, I know it was at, for us, it was at 12th grade vaccine. I, I believe it was the meningitis vaccine that students needed to get. Um, yeah, and, and it, it fell under the, the timing of the state law and no longer allowing the um, philosophical or religious exemptions. So it was kind of a double whammy maybe with COVID and no longer allowing that exemption. Likewise, trust, fellow math guy that you're taking 
that happen. So, he's not here. He's now at Wells. Oh, he's been at Wells for probably five or six years. Say five, six, yeah, somewhere in there. Yeah, cool. Yeah, so we have. A new calculus teacher here that is from, um, she has been at Burke Academy. Oh, wow. 